Hi, and welcome to Radonc Talks, a lecture series designed for students and residents of radiation oncology. My name is Rhea. I am currently a PGY-5 resident at the University of Pittsburgh, and today we will be continuing in our prostate cancer series with a discussion on the management of prostate cancer in the post-operative setting, so post-prostatectomy. In our previous talks, uh, we really discussed management of prostate cancer with definitive radiation therapy, and we also discussed um, adding androgen deprivation therapy along with the radiation for patients that have unfavorable intermediate risk disease or higher. Now, not all patients will opt for definitive radiotherapy for managing their prostate cancer. A lot of them might opt for prostatectomy as their definitive treatment. When do we need to intervene with radiation as well as possibly androgen deprivation therapy in the post-prostatectomy setting? As we will learn uh, shortly here, uh, we really think about adding radiation when patients have surgery for localized prostate cancer and then show signs of biochemical progression. Um, and so in this talk, we're going to start by defining biochemical progression in the post-prostatectomy setting, um, and then we're going to get into some of the trials that guide our management in this space. So let's start by defining what is actually considered a biochemical recurrence or biochemical progression. The definition of this really depends on if we're talking about the post-radiation setting or in the post-prostatectomy setting. So I think in the surgery setting, it's a little bit more straightforward. After the prostate gland and seminal vesicles are removed, um, the PSA for our patients should be undetectable, right? Because the prostate is now gone, so the PSA should be undetectable. There are different definitions of biochemical recurrence after surgery. So the AUA definition of biochemical recurrence is a PSA that is greater than 0.2 nanograms per milliliter on two consecutive readings. Also accepted, especially in the era, um, the modern era, where we now have ultra-sensitive PSAs, uh, two consecutive rises of PSA greater than 0.1 nanogram per milliliter is also considered a definition of biochemical recurrence. So the big takeaway here is that after prostatectomy, we expect that PSA to become undetectable. And then um, the biochemical recurrence is defined as either a PSA greater than 0.2 or two consecutive rises of the PSA with a value greater than 0.1. In the post-radiation setting, the post-radiation PSA does not always become undetectable. What we do expect is that it should drop and it should eventually hit its lowest point or its nadir. And we really establish that by closely following up these patients and checking their PSA every few months initially. It'll drop after the radiation, it might drop some more, and then at some point it will hit its lowest value. And then it might start to rise again, but a broadly, defini a broadly accepted definition of a biochemical recurrence is defined by the Phoenix criteria of biochemical recurrence. So the Phoenix criteria says that a PSA rise of greater than 2.0 nanograms per milliliter over the nadir um, so nadir plus two or more is considered a biochemical recurrence. And so if a patient's PSA is, let's say it's seven before treatment, and then it drops to six, and then it drops to four, and then it drops to three, and that's kind of its nadir, and then it becomes 3.1, 3.2. It's reached its nadir and it's kind of rising, but we're really not worried about a rec recurrence at these low values. If the PSA jumps from that nadir of 3 to a value of 5, however, so 2 points above the nadir, that is when we consider it a biochemical recurrence after radiation. Now, of course, we can't just keep a, you know, we can't just get caught up in the Phoenix definition and rely purely on that. We also really care about the PSA doubling time and the PSA velocity, all things that we initially talked about in our overview. Um, but these are some of the most broadly accepted definitions of a biochemical recurrence after either prostatectomy or radiotherapy. And I think the big takeaway here is that after prostatectomy, we routinely expect that that PSA should become undetectable. And if it remains detectable after surgery, that tells us that the disease was not completely eradicated. On the other hand, after radiation, even if it doesn't ever become undetectable, that doesn't mean that the radiation did not completely take care of the disease. So two different definitions depending on what therapy they got. 
So I think those definitions are important to understand, and it's important to realize that after surgery, we expect that patients' PSA will become undetectable. Now, historically, we had data that suggested that for patients who had surgery, who then had certain risk factors at the time of surgery, so things like positive margins or T3 disease, meaning they had either extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion, um, these risk factors uh, were obviously higher risk factors, and we should probably offer adjuvant radiotherapy to those patients. That was based on older studies, and they showed a benefit to the biochemical progression-free survival um, just offering adjuvant radiation across the board for anyone with certain risk factors. In the modern era, um, what we have learned based on more updated trials is that we don't necessarily need to offer adjuvant radiation to all of these patients. What we can do is monitor their PSA after surgery, even if they have these risk factors, and if their PSA remains undetectable and they don't have a biochemical recurrence, then that tells us that we have eradicated their disease with surgery alone. However, if that PSA never becomes undetectable, or if the PSA becomes undetectable and then starts to rise again um, at some point later, then they're telling us that they still have disease that we need to address, and that is really when we intervene with radiation. So what we practice in the modern era, we actually call that a salvage radiation approach. But historically, we were offering adjuvant radiation to any patients with high-risk disease. So let's start by talking about those historical trials, and then we'll talk about the, the more modern trials that support salvage radiation. So here are some historical studies that probably are not super applicable for our practice in the modern era, but they are important to be aware of for a historical perspective as well as for board exams. So SWOG 8794, EORTC 22911, and then the ARO 9602 study. So all of these studies took patients that were status post-radical prostectomy and either had a positive surgical margin or T3 and 0 disease, so either extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion, which is the definition of pathologic T3 disease. Now, the SWOG study and the EORTC studied uh, really allowed for patients with any PSA value. Um, the ARO study, however, specified that the PSA had to be undetectable, so less than 0.1 nanograms per milliliter, which means undetectable. Um, only the ARO study specified that patients truly had to have an undetectable PSA after having that surgery. The SWOG and the EORTC studies did not specify that, which means theoretically, if the PSA was detectable, it wasn't really, you know, you were already doing salvage at that point. It wasn't really true adjuvant. Um, but anyway, these were the three studies. They took patients with positive uh, surgical margins or T3 disease, and then they randomized them to either observation or radiation around 60 gray and 30 fractions to the prostate fossa. Um, and they, so they were randomized to observation versus radiotherapy um, alone. And in the SWOG study, no ADT was allowed. The 10-year results of all of these studies showed that there was an improvement in the biochemical progression-free survival with the addition of radiation. So the biochemical progression-free survival went from somewhere around 30 to 35% with observation up to around 60% with radiation. So the improvement in biochemical progression-free survival almost doubled. The EORTC study um, and the ARO study did not show any benefit to the survival, but the SWOG study actually showed around a 10% improvement in survival as well. Um, so the survival went from 66% with observation up to 74% with um, the radiation. So all three studies showed improvement in biochemical progression-free survival, but only the SWOG study showed an overall survival benefit. And they also showed an improvement in um, distant metastasis-free survival. So based on these trials, again, all patients were post-operative after radical prostectomy, and they had either positive surgical margins or pathologic T3 disease, so invading things, right? Either extracapsular invasion or seminal vesicle invasion. 
and they were randomized to observation versus adjuvant radiation. And adjuvant radiation improved biochemical um, progression-free survival from around 30% without any intervention up to 60% with radiotherapy. And then again, only the SWOG study showed an improvement in overall survival and distant metastasis-free survival. And so based on these older studies, the standard of care historically was to just routinely offer adjuvant radiotherapy for anyone with those high-risk factors, so positive surgical margin or T3 disease. But then somewhere along the way, we ask the question, well, do all of these men truly need adjuvant radiotherapy? Can we kind of monitor them with a PSA? And if their PSA stays undetectable after surgery, um, maybe they don't actually have any residual disease or recurrent disease, and maybe we can continue to watch them. Um, but if their PSA becomes undetectable and then starts to rise again, which tells us they're having a biochemical recurrence, maybe we only intervene with radiation at that point. And that is called an early salvage approach. And um, there were a series of trials that we'll talk about that investigated exactly that. And what they found is that treating with early salvage radiation, so only treating with radiation if they have evidence of biochemical recurrence, um, versus adjuvant, meaning everybody gets post-operative radiation if they have those risk factors, um, what they found is that the early salvage radiation actually works. It does not uh, sacrifice any of the cancer outcomes in these patients, and it actually spares around 50% of patients from having to undergo post-operative radiation. So you're sparing them um, all of the, you know, morbidity of having to go post-operative radiation. Um, and so that is really what we practice now in the modern era is this early salvage approach where we monitor their PSA post-prostatectomy. We look for evidence of a biochemical recurrence if that PSA becomes undetectable. And only then do we intervene um, with early salvage radiation if they have biochemical recurrence. So here are the three salvage radiotherapy trials that randomize patients to adjuvant versus early salvage radiation. And, you know, those SWOG, EORTC, and ARO studies are definitely important for historical perspective, and they're important to know for boards. But RAVES, RADICALS, and JETUG, AFU-17, I would say, are the three most important trials for us to know um, in the post-prostatectomy setting that guide our management to salvage radiotherapy. So all three of these trials ask that exact question that we talked about. Instead of adjuvant radiation, can we just watch their PSA and only come in with early salvage radiation if it starts to rise again? Um, and so all three trials took patients who had undergone radical prostatectomy and had either positive surgical margins or T3 disease or higher, and they all had to have a low post-operative PSA. So in RAVES and JATUG, that post-op PSA was less than 0.1. In RADICALS, it was less than 0.2. They then took those patients and either randomized them to adjuvant radiation or early salvage radiation. And how did they approach early salvage radiation? Well, they had a threshold for who needs to get radiation. So in RAVES and in JATUG, the salvage threshold was a PSA of 0.2. In radicals, it was a PSA of 0.1 and rising for two consecutive values, or any consecutive PSA rises times three. So basically, a biochemical recurrence, right? So if patients had a biochemical recurrence, they then went on to receive salvage radiation, either to the prostate fossa alone, as in RAVES, or um, whole pelvic radiotherapy was optional for the radicals and JATUG. And then JATUG also gave everyone six months of androgen deprivation therapy. Um, radicals actually had a separate arm, uh, which we will talk about um, later in this talk, um, called Radicals HD, where they randomized them to various um, intervals of androgen deprivation therapy. So zero months or six months or 24 months. Um, so we'll talk about that later. But the bottom line is after a biochemical recurrence in the salvage arm, um, they got radiation at least to the prostate fossa, and some of the trials allowed whole pelvis radiation and androgen deprivation therapy as well. At five years, they found no significant difference in biochemical progression-free survival in any of the trials between the salvage arm and the adjuvant arm. 
So in raves and radicals, the biochemical progression-free survival was in the mid-80s, somewhere around 86 to 88%. In Jatug, remember, where everyone got six months of ADT, um, the event-free survival was around 90 to 92%. And none of these were statistically significantly different. Um, and so the salvage approach was considered non-inferior. The other thing I want to point out is in the salvage arm, so, so in the adjuvant arm, right, obviously everyone had to get radiation. How many patients that were followed in the salvage arm actually met the criteria for biochemical recurrence and went on to receive the intervention? It turns out that it was around 50% of patients. Um, so in raves, it was 50%. In radicals, it was 32%. And in Jatug AFU, it was 54%. Um, and so around 50% of the patients actually needed salvage radiation and the rest of them were just continued to be observed because their PSA never actually became detectable again. And so these trials tell us that there's no significant difference in the biochemical progression-free survival or event-free survival with a salvage approach compared to an adjuvant approach. And actually, with the salvage approach, we can spare around half of our patients from needing post-operative radiation. And so um, there was also a meta-analysis called the artistic meta-analysis, and these results were confirmed. So in the artistic meta-analysis, 39% of patients actually needed salvage radiation. So they were actually able to spare around 60% total from needing any um, radiation post-operatively. And then the event-free survival was around 88 to 89% in both arms um, and no significant difference. So we have the RAVES, Radicals, and Jatug trials, as well as the artistic meta-analysis that combined all three of these trials and told us that there's no significant difference in biochemical progression-free survival or event-free survival with salvage versus adjuvant radiation. And with the salvage approach, when we actually monitor their PSA, wait for a biochemical recurrence, and only if they have that do we intervene with radiation, that approach spares around 50% of men from needing radiation. So just to summarize everything that we've talked about to this point, historically, patients with particular risk factors, so a positive surgical margin, or T3 disease, so extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion, um, historically, we had data that showed us that if these risk factors existed, then adding adjuvant radiation to all of these patients um, benefits them in terms of their biochemical progression-free survival. However, more modern studies, the RAVES, Radical, and JTUG study, and then the artistic meta-analysis that combined results of all of those studies, showed us that if we actually just do early salvage radiation rather than across the board adjuvant for everyone, if we monitor their PSA and only intervene if they have biochemical recurrence, early salvage radiation actually has an equivalent biochemical progression-free survival. And with that approach, we can spare around half of our patients from needing any adjuvant radiotherapy. And so that is really what we practice in the modern era after post-prostatectomy. So even if they have a positive margin, even if they have T3 disease, so those high-risk factors, you know, all these patients, we're going to follow them long term with PSA values. And if their PSA remains undetectable, then well and good. They don't have any evidence of disease. But if that PSA starts to show signs of biochemical recurrence, and remember we talked about the different definitions, so either 0.1 and rising or greater than 0.2, um, if, if we can show that they have biochemical recurrence, then at that point we should offer post-operative radiation, at minimum post-operative radiation to the prostate fossa. Now, keep in mind that all of these trials that we talked about, RAVES, radicals, and JTUG, they first, before these patients were enrolled into the study, they verified that their PSA was undetectable um, prior to enrolling, right? So RAVES and JTUG made sure it was less than 0.1. The radicals trial made sure that it was less than 0.2. Some patients, after they have surgery, might just have an elevated PSA right off the bat on that first PSA value. Typically, in that scenario, what we would do is just recheck the PSA in a very short interval and make sure that it remains high. And if it does, then that tells us that we have not completely eradicated their disease. And so in that case, we're giving them radiation, and um, it's really 
you know, it's, it's not even salvage after a biochemical recurrence. They really just require adjuvant radiation because their PSA never, uh, never became undetectable. So now hopefully we have a good understanding of who should we think about radiation to the prostate fossa um, after surgery um, if they have either their PSA never becomes undetectable after surgery or if they have a biochemical recurrence. Now, the trials that we talked about, RAVES, radicals, and JATUG, they were not completely, um, you know, in uniform in terms of their approach to adding androgen deprivation therapy and also in their approach to adding pelvic radiation. You know, that was really left up to the treating physician. And so now we're going to go through some studies that kind of help us to understand when we're offering post-prostatectomy radiotherapy, which patients should we think about adding androgen deprivation therapy, and who should we think about adding pelvic radiotherapy uh, when we're treating in the salvage setting. Um, and so what we'll find is that this is kind of a not a totally black and white area. It's definitely a gray area, um, and a lot of physicians will kind of tailor um, how they approach this problem based on the patient's risk. So taking into account their, not just their PSA, but also their T-stage, their Gleason score. Um, and in the modern era, we also sometimes will try to incorporate their genomic risk factors. Um, so kind of that decipher genomic risk score. And when we do give androgen deprivation therapy, the duration can be up to two years. Um, everyone is wary of two years of androgen deprivation therapy, of course, because it's not without side effects, um, but we'll find that some patients really benefit from it um, and, and it has shown benefit. Um, so let's go through some of these trials and try to kind of outline the evidence here. The first trial that we'll talk about is RTOG 9601 that took patients after surgery, and they had radical prostatectomy and lymph node dissection, and they had a PSA of 0.2 to 4, and they were randomized to either salvage radiotherapy with placebo for two years, or salvage radiotherapy with ADT, uh, 150 milligrams of bicalutamide daily for two years. The radiation that they received um, was 64.8 gray and 36 fractions to their prostate bed, so 1.8 gray per fraction, and they did not treat the pelvic nodes. All of these patients had um, negative lymph node dissections, so they were node negative. And these patients were, like we said, randomized to radiation to the prostate fossa alone or um, ADT. And in, you know, if they weren't getting ADT, they were taking placebo pills for two years. The compliance with um, the placebo or the ADT pills was around 70% in all the patients at around two years. And what they found is that with two years of androgen deprivation therapy, overall survival, prostate cancer-specific survival, um, distant metastasis, and biochemical progression-free survival were all significantly improved with the addition of ADT. So there was about a 5% improvement in overall survival, 76% um, with ADT versus 71% with placebo. Prostate cancer mortality was cut in half, so 6% with ADT versus 13% with placebo. Um, there was about a 10% improvement in distant metastasis rates, so 15% rate of DM with ADT, um, up to 23% with the placebo. And then the second biochemical failure rates were also significantly lower, 40% with ADT, up to 68% with placebo. And so radiation plus two years of ADT significantly improved overall survival, prostate cancer-specific survival, distant metastasis-free survival, and biochemical progression-free survival. The big toxicity with bicalutamide for two years was gynecomastia. Um, you know, there's also, you know, cardiac toxicity and um, hepatotoxicity and things like that. But the big toxicity with taking bicalutamide every day, 70% of those patients had gynecomastia versus only 11% in the placebo arm. Um, and so, you know, we typically don't prescribe bicalutamide alone if we're doing long-term androgen deprivation therapy. We'll often opt for an LHRH agonist like luprolide or gosarelin, and bicalutamide we often just use as a bridging therapy to that LHRH agonist. But bottom line, RTOG 9601, two years of ADT in the salvage radiation setting significantly improved many outcomes, including overall survival, um, and, and so this was uh, the outcome of 9601.
There was a secondary analysis of RTOG 9601 that was published, and the big takeaway from this secondary analysis is that the overall survival benefit for two years of androgen deprivation therapy was really seen in patients that had a PSA that was greater than 0.6. Um, so 0.6 is a very important number to remember for 9601, um, and that's sort of the cutoff. For patients that had a PSA of 0.6 or less, they not only saw that there was no significant survival benefit, but they also saw that there was increased other cause mortality, um, higher risk of grade 3 to 5 cardiac events. Um, and so the secondary analysis of 9601 tells us that there's improved survival with two years of ADT for patients with a PSA that's greater than 0.6, and it really does not improve um, if we add ADT for patients with a PSA of less than 0.6, and in fact, adding that much ADT can actually increase our other cause mortality. Um, so we do need to be careful about who we are putting on two years of androgen deprivation therapy. It's certainly not without uh, side effects. Jatug AFU-16 is another study um, that looked at salvage radiation with or without androgen deprivation therapy. Um, and, you know, very similar to 9601, they took no negative patients who had undergone surgery and initially had an undetectable postoperative PSA, and then it started to rise. Um, these patients were randomized to postoperative radiation alone, and they only added pelvic radiation if the patients did not have a nodal dissection. Versus postoperative radiation, 66 gray and 33 fractions, plus six months of androgen deprivation therapy. And in this trial, the ADT was a gosarelin injection. So that is an LHRH agonist. Jatug AFU-16 showed that the 10-year biochemical progression-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival significantly improved with six months of androgen deprivation therapy plus radiotherapy. In this trial, importantly, they defined biochemical failure as an increase in the PSA concentration by 0.5 from the nadir, so different than the Phoenix definition that we talked about previously. Um, but the biochemical progression-free survival with um, ADT went from 64% um, with ADT and radiation down to 49% with radiation alone. So there was a significant improvement with six months of ADT. The distant metastasis-free survival also improved by around 6%, so 75% with ADT versus 69% without, and there was no change in survival. They did a post hoc subgroup analysis um, for the benefit of biochemical progression free survival based on risk, and they found that it improved in both the low risk and the high risk subgroup. And on their initial publication, they actually suggested that there was a greater magnitude of benefit to the addition of androgen deprivation in patients with a PSA greater than 0.5. Um, and they found no significant differences in toxicity or quality of life between groups. So based on Jatug AFU-16, um, the trial suggested that salvage radiation with short-term androgen deprivation, so six months, also improves biochemical progression-free survival compared to salvage alone. Now, the RADICALS trial, remember we talked about RADICALS RT, which was one of the salvage radiation trials. They also had another randomization, and the patients that were included in the randomization for hormone therapy were included in RADICALS HD. And just this year, they published um, two different analyses from RADICALS HD. There was a zero months versus six months, and then there was a six months versus 24 months. Um, so we're going to start by talking about the zero months versus six months um, publication. So in Radicals HD zero versus six months, they included patients, uh, 1,400 patients with predominantly intermediate risk prostate cancer. And they had patients that were treated with both um, adjuvant radiation as well as salvage radiation. And these patients were randomized to either no androgen deprivation therapy or six months of androgen deprivation. And they had different options as to what they could get for androgen deprivation therapy. They found that there was no significant difference in their primary endpoint of distant metastasis-free survival 
with zero months versus uh, six months of androgen deprivation, again, in a predominantly intermediate risk group. So the distant metastasis free survival was just around 80% in both arms um, at 10 years with no significant difference. They had a secondary endpoint of clinical progression-free survival and time to salvage androgen deprivation therapy, and that did show a significant benefit with short-term androgen deprivation. So the hazard ratio is around 0.5 for both um, outcomes, so the clinical progression-free survival as well as the time to salvage androgen deprivation. But their primary endpoint of distant metastasis-free survival was not significantly um, improved. And again, remember, the patients on radicals HD were predominantly intermediate risk. The other publication was uh, six months versus 24 months androgen deprivation therapy. And um, this was the other publication from Radicals HD. They had around 1,500 patients on this publication. And these patients were predominantly high risk. So they had Gleason score of 8 to 10, um, T3A, or higher disease prostate cancer. And once again, they included patients with both adjuvant as well as salvage radiation. They were randomized to radiation for six months, versus radiation for, or sorry, radiation and six months of androgen deprivation therapy, not radiation for six months, but radiation plus six months of androgen deprivation, or radiation plus 24 months of androgen deprivation. And in this trial, the distant metastasis-free survival actually did improve significantly with the long-term androgen deprivation. There was a 6% improvement in 10-year uh, distant metastasis free survival. So 72% with short term versus 78% with long term androgen deprivation. And you can see the Kaplan Meyer curve starting to separate. It's not a huge separation, but it's a 6% separation at 10 years. Again, the downside of long term androgen deprivation is a longer duration of adverse events. And they did do an analysis, and the, there did not seem to be any interaction between the benefit of androgen deprivation and PSA levels. So for a trial that looked at predominantly high-risk patients, long-term androgen deprivation versus short-term actually seemed to improve the metastasis-free survival, 78% um, versus 72%, again, at the cost of a longer duration of side effects from hormonal therapy. The last study I want to mention before we sort of take a step back and try to synthesize all this data is the SPORT trial, also called RTOG0534, that not only um, looked at adding short-term androgen deprivation therapy, but also looked at potentially adding pelvic lymph node uh, radiotherapy. So this trial also took patients with prostate cancer. They had to have PT2 to 3 disease, a Gleason score less than or equal to 9, and they underwent surgery and had an initially undetectable PSA that was then rising somewhere between 0.1 to 2, so a true definition of salvage radiotherapy. And they were randomized to either radiotherapy to the prostate bed alone, so 64.8 to 70.2 gray at 1.8 gray per fraction, prostate bed radiotherapy plus short-term androgen deprivation with four to six months um, of ADT, or prostate bed radiotherapy with pelvic lymph node radiation as well with short-term androgen deprivation therapy. So for the um, radiotherapy, they did 45 gray to the pelvis, and then they did a sequential boost, um, so kind of cone down uh, to just treat the prostate bed to a higher dose of 64.8 to 70.2 gray. Um, and all these patients got short-term ADT in this arm. So the five-year results of the study actually showed that there was improved biochemical progression-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival, but not overall survival with um, that last arm of prostate radiation plus pelvic lymph node radiation plus short-term androgen deprivation therapy. So the five-year um, biochemical progression-free survival was 87% in that third arm, um, and then it was 71% in prostate bed alone, 81% in prostate bed plus short-term radiation, or, I'm sorry, short-term androgen deprivation, um, and then it was all the way up to 87% with all three of those interventions. And again, for biochemical progression-free survival, they used the Phoenix definition. 
the rates of five-year um, distant metastasis were also significantly improved in that third arm with only 5%. And then the five-year overall survival was the same, around 95% in all arms. They did a subset analysis and found that the benefit to adding pelvic lymph node radiation um, to prostate bed radiotherapy and short-term androgen deprivation was really there for patients with a PSA greater than 0.35. Um, and then in terms of toxicity, they did see worse acute and late toxicity in arms two and three, mostly um, hematologic toxicity. Um, and they saw significantly worse rates of both acute as well as late um, grade two or worse hematologic toxicity. So the conclusion from the RTOG0534 or SPORT trial was that salvage radiation with um, pelvic radiotherapy to 45 gray and then short-term androgen deprivation for four to six months significantly improves biochemical progression-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival without an improvement in overall survival. And although the study was not powered for this specific subgroup analysis, it did seem like there was a benefit for patients with a PSA greater than 0.35. Um, and this was a short five-year follow-up. Um, we definitely need to follow these patients for longer and get that longer-term follow-up. So at this point, um, my head is certainly spinning, and yours might be too, um, because how do we make heads, of, heads or tails of this data, right? Um, I have so many questions. How long should we be giving androgen deprivation therapy? Six months, 24 months? Should all of our patients be getting pelvic nodal irradiation or should we use that cut point of 0.35 as per the sport analysis? I think in reality, um, you will find that this is often a very individualized decision and practice patterns definitely vary depending on who you talk to, um, kind of what, how they interpret this data. I think this data can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Many physicians, I think, are wary of the side effects of two years of androgen deprivation therapy. Um, and so we don't take this decision lightly. And, and we really try to consider the, the patient as a whole, um, obviously what they can tolerate and, and what they've already been through. And then we think about the risk factors of their disease. So things like their Gleason score, their T stage, their pretreatment PSA, as well as their PSA trend. Um, and then we also can try to use genomic classifiers to, to try to help risk stratify. So if you recall, I think we've talked about the Decipher genomic risk classifier before, um, but it basically gives us a score on a scale of 0 to 1 based on 22 different genes. Um, and it helps us to think about the patient's uh, risk of, of biochemical progression and, and distant metastasis. So um, there was actually a prospectively designed validation study for the Decipher genomic uh, classifier in the patients that were in RTOG 9601. And in this paper, um, you know, the, the Decipher score significantly correlated with oncologic outcomes when it was established or when it was examined both as a continuous as well as a categorical variable. And so it has been kind of validated as a prognostic marker for biochemical progression-free survival, distant metastasis-free survival, and overall survival. And then NRGG006 is a phase two study that is now closed to accrual, and we're waiting on its results, but it randomized patients um, to salvage radiation with or without apalutamide um, based on the Decipher genomic risk score. Um, so you know, I think some practitioners may be using Decipher Genomic Classifier to help guide their decisions. Um, and currently, it has not been validated as a predictive tool to help us predict response to therapy. Um, but it certainly is something that, that is developing and, and we're pending the results of NRGG006. Um, but, you know, I think we are at a point where genomic risk classifiers are definitely on their way to becoming predictive tools and, and helping us to risk stratify treatment for our patients based on that genomic risk score. Also recently published uh, were guidelines um, from ASTRO, AUA, and SUO, and they're, it's a three-part um, publication um, for management of uh, salvage radiation in the biochemically recurrent setting for prostate cancer. And they talk about indications for adding androgen deprivation to salvage radiotherapy in part two of their um, 
three-part consensus guideline. So their indications include things like grade group 4 to 5 disease, stage PT3B to 4 disease, um, surgical margin status, node positive disease, short PSA doubling time, um, a short interval from that primary therapy to PSA recurrence, a higher post-prostatectomy PSA, as well as a genomic uh, classifier risk and imaging findings on PET. Um, so I think these guidelines can certainly help us. Um, you know, they were published before the Radicals HD data, so they did not really comment on the duration of hormonal therapy. Um, but, you know, I think these guidelines are also helpful to fall back on if we're ever unsure. Genomic risk classifier is mentioned in these guidelines, and that can be helpful as well. Um, they did raise a point about surgical margin status, and I think this is really interesting to note. So if patients do have positive surgical margins, um, as you can probably imagine, they are at increased risk of recurrence. However, um, they're also at a lower risk of progression after undergoing salvage radiotherapy. And when I was doing rat on questions, I actually got a question on this. And it makes sense if you think about it, why they might be at a lower risk of progression after salvage radiation. Because if we're giving them salvage radiation for a rising um, PSA in the post-surgery setting, and they actually have a surgical margin that was positive, then we're more likely to treat the disease with radiation because it's probably in the prostate fossa, right, if they do have a positive surgical margin. So that's actually kind of a good thing in a way because it tells us that there's probably a lower risk of progression after salvage radiation. Um, so just wanted to make that point about positive surgical margins um, and then also kind of just keep in mind that these are various indications for adding ADT to salvage radiotherapy. So moving on now, um, so far we have talked about salvage radiation. So, you know, when the PSA is undetectable um, after surgery and then they later have evidence of biochemical recurrence based on those various criteria that we talked about. There are certain patients, however, that we would actually just give adjuvant radiotherapy where after surgery, if certain features are present, then we we just go ahead and give them all adjuvant radiotherapy. Now, we already talked about one of those indications where, you know, if that PSA never becomes undetectable after surgery, right, that is a situation where they've kind of declared themselves that they still have residual disease somewhere, and so they would probably benefit from postoperative radiation. The other situation is if they have pathologic node-positive disease. Uh, we'll talk about some studies that we have, but... They basically tell us that there's an all-cause mortality benefit with adjuvant radiation um, versus salvage for patients with pathologic node-positive disease. Now, keep in mind that if we know up front that patients have node-positive disease, remember node-positive disease is considered stage 4A for prostate cancer. Um, and we, we talked about this previously in this series, but there's not great data, but typically I think the gestalt is to manage these patients with radiotherapy because they're higher risk. And if they are already node positive, then we feel like we don't have a great chance of getting that PSA to be undetectable after surgery. However, um, sometimes patients will clinically not have any evidence of nodes. And then at the time of surgery, we will find that they actually had pathologic node positivity. And that's why lymph node dissection is so important. Um, so let's talk about some of the data that we have in this space. Of course, this is not, um, this is a pretty challenging situation and we don't have a lot of, uh, or any really randomized data um, to guide our decision making, but we do have a couple of retrospective studies. Um, so the first retrospective study I'll share is from Abdullah et al. Um, that was published in 2014 and it was a retrospective study of 1,100 patients who had um, radical prostatectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection with PN1 disease, and they performed a regression tree analysis. So all these patients were treated with um, androgen deprivation therapy adjuvantly with or without adjuvant radiotherapy. And if they did receive adjuvant radiotherapy, um, most of them were treated to both the prostate fossa as well as the pelvis within 90 days. And what they found based on the regression tree analysis is that there were two specific groups that actually seemed to derive um, a case-specific mortality benefit. So those were patients that had either one to two nodes with a Gleason score of seven to 10 
and um, T3B to 4 disease or positive surgical margins. The other group that seemed to derive a benefit were patients that had three to four nodes. If you look at the, the table and kind of how this regression tree was, was designed, um, the, the group that's highlighted in the red box, so the patients that we just talked about, one to two nodes with a Gleason score of seven to 10 and pathologic T3B to four disease or positive surgical margins, and then three to four nodes, kind of fall in that medium range. There are certain lower risk patients um, with a Gleason score of 7 to 10 and negative surgical margins or T2 to T3A disease, and also even lower, so Gleason score of 2 to 6 that don't seem to derive a benefit. And then there's also higher risk patients with greater than four positive nodes that don't seem to derive any benefit. So really here, there's kind of seems to be a medium range where intervening with postoperative radiation does seem to help. The more recent data that we have in this space is by first author Tilke et al., and they performed a retrospective study of patients with PT2 to T4 disease and pathologic N1 prostate cancer who underwent radical prostatectomy. And then they looked at patients that were treated with no radiation versus salvage radiation versus adjuvant radiation. And um, they stratified patients based on the number of lymph nodes that were positive, so one to three versus four or more. What they found is that adjuvant radiotherapy significantly decreased the all-cause mortality risk compared to salvage radiation in the entire cohort. So adjuvant radiation provided an 8% improvement in all-cause mortality um, with each additional lymph node that was positive. So when they looked at all-cause mortality for patients with greater than or equal to four nodes, the all-cause mortality went from 8% um, with salvage radiation up to, or down, I'm sorry, 8% with salvage radiation up to 23% with adjuvant radiotherapy, and that was statistically significant. So higher all-cause mortality with adjuvant compared to salvage. In the group with just one to three nodes, there was not a statistical significance there. So the all-cause mortality went from 13% with salvage up to 14% with adjuvant radiotherapy. However, um, what they found is that they estimated around a 3% benefit in all-cause mortality for um, the subgroup that was one to three nodes. And so you would actually need a very large sample size to show this. And so perhaps the study was just underpowered to show an, a significant improvement in all-cause mortality. Um, and so the conclusion from this trial was that adjuvant radiotherapy improves all-cause mortality in patients with PN1 prostate cancer. And for each additional lymph node, there's around an 8% improvement in all-cause mortality. So again, I think the textbook answer is that for pathologic node positive disease, we do try to offer adjuvant radiation rather than early salvage um, as we do for patients with positive surgical margin or T3 to T4 disease. Um, but again, uh, in practice, you will see individualized decision making um, based on the patient. The last section that I'll mention here uh, before we conclude is um, a trial that looked at dose escalation in post-operative um, radiotherapy and uh, did not find a benefit. So SAC09-10 um, was a randomized trial that looked at dose-escalated salvage radiotherapy. Um, so they randomized patients undergoing salvage radiation to either 64 gray conventionally fractionated radiation um, versus 70 gray of dose escalated radiotherapy. And they found no significant improvement in the biochemical progression-free survival with dose escalation. So the six-year biochemical progression-free survival was just around 61 to 62 percent in both arms. What they did see was that there was significantly worse grade two or worse GI toxicity with um, 70 gray as compared to 64 gray. So the late rates of grade two or worse GI toxicity were 20% with 70 gray versus 7% um, with 64 gray, and that was significant. So no significant benefit to dose escalation for the prostate fossa, and so typically we, we don't utilize that. We typically just treat um, to around 64 gray when we're treating the prostate fossa. Um, the only time that I've seen actual kind of dose escalation is if 
you know, we get a PSMA PET scan in that post-operative setting and there's gross residual disease. If you're boosting gross residual disease, then um, I think people would typically take that to a higher dose. Um, but if, if you're not boosting any gross residual disease, then we're not routinely dose escalating for the prostate fossa. One other thing I want to mention, I don't have a trial on, or a, sorry, a slide on this, um, but there was a trial, NRGGU003, that compared conventional fractionation um, to a moderately hypofractionated regimen. They used 62.5 gray and 25 fractions, and they found that hypofractionation was non-inferior, um, but they did see numerically higher grade three or worse GI and GU toxicities in the hypofractionated arm, and they saw some worse acute bowel um, symptoms too with hypofractionation. So there is data for hypofractionation, seems like it's non-inferior, but may have worse toxicity. So big takeaways um, from the last couple of sections that we just talked about. Um, we first looked at some retrospective data um, for adjuvant radiation for um, pathologic node positive disease. And we saw that there's probably an, a mortality benefit to adjuvant radiation for pathologic node positive disease. And that Tilke study showed around an 8% benefit in all cause mortality um, per additional lymph node. Um, and, and that's a relative um, benefit. For SAC09 and 10, um, we looked at no benefit to dose escalation. So SAC09 and 10 compared 64 gray versus 70 gray to the prostate fossa and found no significant benefit to dose escalation and actually worse late uh, grade two or worse GI toxicity. So we typically would only dose escalate if there's actually gross disease. So somewhere on the order of 74 gray, like similar to what conventionally we would do for um, intact prostate, um, but only if there's gross residual disease in the prostate fossa that we can clinically see, um, but if not, no benefit to dose escalation. So big takeaways from uh, kind of all of the data that we've talked about here, um, just to kind of drive some important points home. So we started by talking about historical data for adjuvant radiation for patients with either positive surgical margins or T3 disease. Uh, what we found based on more modern studies, including the RAVES, Radicals, and JATUG data, as well as um, the artistic meta-analysis that combined all three of those studies, we found that an early salvage radiotherapy approach is equivalent to adjuvant radiotherapy in terms of biochemical progression-free survival. And if we really monitor that PSA and if it becomes undetectable after surgery and then has a biochemical recurrence in the post-prostatectomy setting, with that early salvage approach, we can actually spare around 50% of patients from needing um, post-operative radiotherapy with early salvage. Um, so that's really the standard um, in the modern era is to kind of watch that PSA. Now, if the PSA never becomes undetectable after surgery, um, then we, we think about kind of doing adjuvant radiation. We also talked about these questions of androgen deprivation therapy and pelvic lymph node radiotherapy in the post-operative setting, um, along with salvage radiation. And um, there's data for at least six months of androgen deprivation therapy, and we may consider even up to two years. Um, and, you know, this is a very individualized decision-making process, taking into account many different risk factors. As we showed in some of the studies, you know, RTOG 9601 showed a benefit for a PSA greater than 0.6 for um, long-term androgen deprivation. And so we kind of use those risk factors, the clinical risk factors, as well as um, decipher genomic uh, classifier to kind of help guide those treatment decisions. We also talked about patients with pathologic node positive disease, and that can be another indication for adjuvant rather than salvage radiotherapy. Um, and then finally, we talked about no benefit to dose escalation in the post-prostatectomy setting. And 64 gray, conventionally fractionated, is probably sufficient. Um, the only exception to this would be if you have gross residual or recurrent disease that you can clinically see on a scan, um, then you would consider boosting that to kind of definitive, um, definitive doses. That brings us to an end here. Um, hopefully this was helpful in kind of consolidating a discussion on management of prostate cancer in the post-prostatectomy setting. I, I think I say this at the end of pretty much every prostate uh, lecture, but you know, this is 
First of all, not all of the data that we could possibly discuss. There are lots and lots and lots of papers in the prostate cancer world. Um, so I really try to just include what is most uh, salient and, and some of the important trials that I have actually seen um, kind of come up in, in clinical decision making for patients. Um, the other thing that I hope I've emphasized throughout is that, you know, all of this data um, is, is kind of a gray area, I think, and, and nothing is black and white in medicine. I think there are certain things that are absolutely wrong and certain things that are absolutely right. And I think most practitioners fall somewhere in the middle of kind of a normal distribution where, you know, th there is diversity and I think variation in, in practice. Um, if you go from one institution to another, and even if you look at one physician to another within an institution, I think everybody interprets this data differently. And I think at the end of the day, everyone is trying to do what is best for their patients. And, and there's going to be a lot of um, heterogeneity just based on patient populations that are different between practices and things like that. So um, I, I just, I hope that this data is helpful. I hope that um, this discussion is helpful to kind of contextualize a lot of different um, studies. Um, but again, keep in mind that, you know, in real life, people are going to do things differently based on their own experience and, and based on their own interpretation of the data. Um, my goal here is really just to kind of point out some of the important trials and, and go over some data that might be pertinent um, for board exams. Um, so sorry for that long little spiel at the end, but I hope this was helpful and thank you so much for your time.